OK, welcome, everyone, to today's Google Webmaster Central Office Hours Hangouts. Uh, my name is John Mueller. I'm a Webmaster Trends Analyst here at Google in Switzerland. And a part of what I do is talk with webmasters and publishers, people who make websites, like uh, the folks here in the Hangout, and um, help try to answer questions that come up. Uh, so with that, I see we have some new faces or some newer faces in the Hangout. Uh, do any of you new people here in the Hangouts have any questions that I can start off with? Hey, Hello, John. John. Hi. Go ahead. Yes. Um, well, this is my first time, so yeah. Uh, apologies if I'm asking two basic questions here, but uh, following up on uh, Mihai's uh, rel next and uh, previous um, canonical tags, I'm actually facing an issue at the moment, um, and that's related to uh, paginated uh, URLs. So what happened was we asked the de our developers to add uh, rel next uh, and previous to our paginated pages. Unfortunately, what happened was. Uh, the, the, they added uh, rel equals next to the last search results uh, pages as well. So if uh, they, Google is now crawling URLs which don't even actually ha have any search results uh, in our uh, URLs, in our, in our pages, uh, and have actually got indexed at the moment. So uh, the logic I came up with is actually um, have a parameter added to the URLs so that, uh, and block those uh, uh, URLs which are uh, resulting in uh, zero search results. Unfortunately, I am not able to uh, de-index those pages which have already got indexed in Google, and uh, how to remove those. Uh, and those pages are not even in the sitemap. It's just being generated uh, dynamically just because they added well next. So what, what probably happened there is those pages still return a 200 result code, so that's why we index them like that. Um, Ideally, what you would do there is return a 404 on pages like that, where if you open it based on the URL parameters and you know there's no content on there, just return a 404 so that uh, they can clearly be dropped the next time they're crawled. Uh, another option, if you can't return a 404, is maybe at least put a no index, no follow on those pages so that it doesn't continue following from there. But uh, ideally, you'd really use a 404 on those kind of pages. And it's not something you need to kind of manually remove some from the search results. We'll retry those pages after maybe a couple of months uh, and see if they still exist. And if we see a 404, we'll just drop them then. You don't need to do anything urgently to clean that up. OK. And uh, is this, are you, uh, how satisfied are you with this logic? Like, I, I was thinking, like, if uh, the last page has no such as a result, or if that's the last page, and then add a parameter, let's say crawl equals zero, and then block that uh, you, uh, parameter in robots.txt so that uh, even if accidentally users type uh, page number equals, let's say, 999, and if it doesn't even exist, it still doesn't get crawled by Google. So is that a satisfactory solution to this? Um, I try to just return a 404 or a no index. With the, the robots text block that you're doing there, that's something that if we can't crawl it, we don't know if it exists or not. So we wouldn't know that we should drop it very quickly. Whereas if we see a clear 404 or a no index, then that's a very direct sign for us that we should drop it. OK. Thank you. Thank you so much. Sure. Hey, John. Related to that, um, why do we see um, pages that uh, have been getting 404s for even years? Uh, Google keeps coming back to them and trying them. Is, is there a period after you guys kind of give up, or you just always keep trying URLs that once worked uh, um, to see maybe they uh, show up again? We are very patient. We, we keep <laughs> trying them over and over again. Um, usually what happens is we don't crawl them that frequently uh, at some point. But if you have, I don't know, a million pages and they're not being crawled very frequently, then you still see them kind of every day. So it's something you might still see. But um, one aspect that sometimes plays into that is if we see a new link to those pages, then we'll think maybe we should crawl again. And even without a new link, we'll just sometimes retry them to see if, if we're missing anything. And sometimes we notice that these pages do come back. And uh, it's good that we can bring them back into the index. 
Got it. And on the last chat we had spoken about looking up a domain in the penalty box. Uh, is that something you had a chance to look at or can we look it up now if you haven't? Um, I took a quick look at that and from my point of view that kind of looks fine. It's not something that I'd say that there's anything specific you need to worry about there. Okay, thank you very much for that. But, I mean, you probably already have content on there anyway, so it's something you probably see how, how that content's being crawled and indexed anyway, so... Oh, yeah, we have a lot of... It has, like, 700,000 index pages, so... Yeah, sure. Definitely it's not a, an empty domain. Okay, thank great. You. All right, more questions from new folks to these Hangouts. Anything specific? Otherwise, we'll start with uh, the questions that were submitted. And hi, John. I have a quick question for you. Okay. It's uh, regarding nofollow links for news sites specifically. So I was just wondering uh, where's Google's uh, rationale behind that, because typically they don't want people uh, manipulating search results. So if something is new, then it's important it should be uh, rendered to people. Um, like if a site has specific content and it's been splashed all over the news, uh, shouldn't that site gain credit uh, and be raised higher in search? But by new sites adding uh, nofollow links, this then manipulates the result and obviously buries that site in search. So... You're, you're saying if a site is new, then it has a harder time getting normal links? No, I was just wondering, where's the rationale behind the nofollow? Um, because Google doesn't want people telling them which link should be followed and which link shouldn't be followed, essentially. Uh, they want the most organic uh, results, the most natural results, because they don't want people telling them. Um... Well, for us, it is kind of it is really useful to to understand what kind of background it, there is behind the link. So, for example, if something is an advertisement, then that's important for us to know because then we shouldn't be passing page rank there. Or if it's user generated content, where maybe the webmaster isn't sure if it's really something awesome or not, then having a no follow there is also really helpful. I think to kind of let us know that this isn't something that the webmaster could can always stand behind 100%. So that, I think that really helps us there. And with regards to new sites, it's really also important to keep in mind that we don't just look at links. It's not that we expect all new sites to have the same number of links as everything else. Um, we, we do try to understand how a new site might fit in with the context of existing sites and try to rank that appropriately, even if it doesn't have that many links yet. Or in some cases, even if it doesn't have any links at all yet. So that's something where it's not required that you go out and like build links like crazy so you have followed links to all of your new sites so that they show up in search. We do take into account a large number of factors, and uh, links are just one of those factors. Hey, John, on, on that note, how would you th uh, think about nofollow links? If you had two websites, how would you think of, about links between the two? Uh, would you know follow them? And if yes, in order to you know just be completely objective, is there any risk of um, Google thinking that you don't trust uh, the other website because you're no following links toward that website? The, a link with a nofollow doesn't mean that it's bad. It doesn't mean that you don't trust this other website. It's just really just pa not passing page rank. So from that point of view, if a site has a lot of nofollow links, that doesn't mean it's a bad site. It, it just has a lot of nofollow links that aren't taken into current account in our algorithms. It's not that there is any kind of negative signal that's passed because there are nofollow links around. So that's something to kind of keep in mind there. In general, if these sites uh, belong together, I think having normal followed links between them is fine, especially if you're talking about two sites. If you're talking about hundreds of sites, then obviously that probably doesn't really scale. That's not something that's useful for users. But if you're talking about two sites, I don't see any problem with, with those sites kind of linking between each other, and they belong to the same person, maybe. Uh, they belong together. I think that that can be perfectly fine. 
Thank you. All right, let's run through some of the questions that were submitted, and we'll open it up for discussions again towards the end. Um, one of the Moz SEO correlations shows that if you use Google Analytics as a tractor, there's a positive correlation, I assume, with regards to ranking, or traffic, and search. Uh, what can you say about that? Um, what about other tracking companies, et cetera? Um, so we don't use analytics when, when it comes to crawling, indexing, and ranking. So uh, any correlation that you would see there based on reports like these are, are strictly coincidental. And sometimes it's, it's the case that some technologies, for example, are used on very popular websites. But just because they're using those technologies doesn't mean that uh, they're popular because of that or doesn't mean that they rank well because of that. So that might be just be that Google Analytics is something that works really well for these websites. And uh, if it works well for these websites and they're ranking well in search, then that's, that's great for them. But it's not the case that you would rank better in search by using something like Google Analytics. So it's important to always kind of take this into account when you're looking at uh, these kind of ranking factor analysis reports that sometimes Things might look like they belong together, but it's not because they're they're really related. It's just that they're coincidentally used by the same type of sites that happen to do well here. And that doesn't mean that Google Analytics is something that you need to use or is something that's always great. Um, maybe it works for your website. Maybe it doesn't work for other websites. That's something that's definitely worth looking at. Um, in general, we don't uh, treat Google products in any way differently in search. So if you use Google Analytics or AdSense or AdWords, that doesn't mean you have any advantage or disadvantage in search compared to someone who uses some other tracking system or some other contextual ads or some other advertising solution those kind of things. It's not that we would kind of weigh that more or weigh that less than anything else. And sometimes we see kind of these conspiracy theories about Google give more weight to advertisers or less weight to advertisers so that they advertise more. And uh, that's really not something that we would do there. When it comes to search, we're really, really, we work really hard on being as neutral as possible. And we really make sure that anything that's Google specific doesn't have any special positive or negative benefit when it comes to crawling, indexing, and ranking. Um, if we have a product only for smartphone and we decide only to make a mobile site, uh, how can we do the SEO for that? So you can have a mobile site that's just mobile. That's Perfectly fine. That's not something where you need to have a desktop version uh, for any website. You can have a website that is only mobile. Um, it'll still work on desktop browsers. Of course, maybe the, the display will look a little bit different, but uh, you can have a mobile-only website and, and use that. That's perfectly fine. You can do that in search just like anything else. Um, I think what, what I try to make sure there is that it still works on desktop, that it doesn't like to show an error on desktop, but rather that uh, someone on a desktop can still access it. Because what will generally happen is we'll just include the mobile site in our search results like any other site, and we'll also present it to desktop users. So uh, just make sure that desktop users can still see some of your content. If it's formatted in a way that works best on mobile, that's perfectly fine. You definitely don't need a specific desktop website in addition to a mobile site. Uh, does Google crawl and give the same importance to the content, which is lazy loaded on mobile? For example, we keep loading the content as the user swipes the screen down when on a mobile device. Uh, that's tricky. So if we have the full content on a desktop page, then we'll probably take that into account and use that also for ranking the mobile page. Uh, if it's only a mobile page and if the content only appears when you swipe down, then chances are we won't be able to see all of that content. Uh, the main difficulty there is that uh, when Googlebot loads a page, it doesn't really know what to do to make all of the content appear if it has to do something specific. So if that's with regards to like clicking on tabs and then it loads content, or with regards to swiping in a certain direction or from a certain place, 
all of these things are really hard for us to kind of know what Googlebot should be doing. So that's something where I'd recommend using the Fetches Google tools to kind of see how far does Google actually see the content. Does Google see enough of the content, or um, is there something missing? Because what we sometimes see with pages like that is that they use a type of uh, infinite scrolling, where you can keep scrolling and you see more and more content. And if the additional content is content that we've indexed separately anyway, then it's not that there's anything missing by just uh, indexing the first page. So that's kind of a situation where you have to think about uh, what content am I providing? Is Googlebot able to see all of that? And if so, then maybe it doesn't matter that Googlebot doesn't keep loading when you swipe up. Uh, even after specifically allowing some folders in robots text, the fetches Google tool and test robots text tool remains with some access problems. Is that normal? Uh, no, that shouldn't be the case. So especially the robots text testing tool is one that should give you immediate feedback if a specific URL is blocked by robots text. Um, the fetches Google tool also gives you immediate feedback if embedded content is blocked by robots text. So if there is something within your robots text file that's still not OK, then that would be flagged there. Um, my suspicion, I. I don't know your website. I don't know the, the actual case here. But my suspicion is that maybe the robots text file is pretty complicated. And uh, you're checking a URL that's allowed in one way, but disallowed in a different way. And the disallow kind of is, or the allow is kind of overridden by the disallow. And uh, that can happen with uh, longer robots text files, with more complicated robots text files. So that's something you might want to double check with a friend who also has uh, a website or has worked with robots text. Maybe double check in a webmaster forum to get their feedback on that, and to really try to figure out which line is blocking in the robots text and try to clean that up. Uh, by the way, John, one thing I noticed uh, with uh, these issues is that sometimes it's the case that uh, they have uh, like the HTTP version added in Webmaster Tools, and the HTTPS version has a different robust te text file, so they're kind of comparing uh, separate uh, uh, robots text files. So yeah, that that can happen as well. Um, sometimes what I'll see is that uh, there's like a an allow statement that's just like allow asterisk.css, but the disallow statement is much longer. It's like disallow everything in my template in this specific folder. That's, uh, and CSS files that are located in that longer path uh, will be blocked by something like that. Because by, with the robots text, the order of precedence is such that the longer disallow or allow statement essentially overrides any shorter ones. So the more specific rule overrides the less specific rules. And these are things that are sometimes hard to, to figure out. So having someone else throw an eye on it who's also worked on something around robots text often makes it a lot easier to see, oh, yeah, oh, I totally missed that specific line there. OK, um, our site used to have different URLs for product pages, for example, product slash SKU and product slash product name slash SKU. The first URL is now 301 redirected to the latter, and the old URLs are not listed in the sitemap or anywhere else, yet Search Console still lists them as 404s. Um, so I think I think what might have happened here is that perhaps those URLs returned 404 at one point, and uh, that's been fixed in the meantime. But Googlebot probably went through and crawled a whole bunch of URLs during that short, short time or longer time, depending on how it was set up. And these are probably still errors that are shown in Search Console, where you see the crawl date. And maybe that was right in that time when uh, the redirect wasn't set up, but the page was already removed. So that's something where if at the moment you've cleaned it up properly and those 404s are based on something that was the old state, then I just leave that like that. I wouldn't really worry about that. You can mark them as fixed if you want in Search Console. Uh, the next time we recrawl re those URLs, we'll see the 301 redirect, and we won't show that as a 404. 
Uh, do social signals have an impact on organic rankings in Google? Um, not directly, no. So it's not that there's any kind of a ranking effect there. Uh, to a large part, social networks also have a nofollow on the links that they, they kind of provide when they post this content. So it's not the case that that would give you any kind of a ranking boost there. What you do sometimes see, however, is that these social posts show up in the search results. They can be contented like any other piece of content, and they can rank for your keywords. They can rank for your, your product name. So they can show up in the search results as well, which in turn gives you maybe a little bit more presence, uh, maybe provide some context from users as well in the search results. Another aspect there, specifically around uh, maybe Twitter and Google Plus at the moment, is that when we recognize that there's content on these uh, social networks that are relevant to the user, then we'll try to show that in the search results as well. So I believe we show Twitter content in the US on mobile at the moment. Um, so that's something that might be visible as well. It's not that your content would rank higher because of that, but there is just more content with, with your company name or your brand or your product name out there. And we might choose to show that in search as well. Uh, we're working on a caching policy to improve site speed for a client's website. Uh, can you tell me if the length of the caching rule affects rankings? Is it better to cache for longer as opposed to shorter? Nope. Um, <laughs> Let me just mute you. Oh, okay, already made. OK. Um, so from our point of view, the length of the caching time is irrelevant. Um, it's also not the case that uh, using caching or not using caching will affect search. What might happen is that the caching time affects how often we refresh a page. So if we uh, know, if we see a caching rule for six months, for example, on your CSS files, then maybe we won't refresh them as quickly as if we see a rule that says uh, just one day, for example. So that's something that might have an effect there, but it's not the case that this would affect your rankings. Um, I assume this will help improve the site speed of your, your website, so that's something that's always good. That's something that will affect users a lot more than search engines. So that might have a lot of indirect effects. If you're speeding your site up and people are staying longer on your site, they're doing more on your site, they're buying things on your website, they're recommending it to others because they're able to kind of uh, stay longer on your site and find more content, then that might be an indirect aspect there in that uh, people are recommending your site more. So we can take that into account for search. Um, there's some kind of operating system that you or a proper Google engineer can access and, for example, apply some algorithm change to a very specific geolocation. Um, not really sure what you mean there with the question, Christian. Um, so uh, let's see. So I guess it's not really an operating system in that regard, but uh, it's and it's not the case that we would apply specific algorithms to specific locations, uh, because we do try to make our algorithms such that they work everywhere. That's uh, for us. That's the most efficient way to work. In that, uh, if we have one algorithm that works across all locations, across all kinds of websites, then that makes it a lot easier. But we do have, for example, debugging tools that help us to understand what's happening in specific search results in specific locations. So it's more that we can kind of look into those search results and see, oh, this went wrong here in this specific location. Someone has to work on improving this algorithm in general, or maybe to catch these kind of corner cases better. But uh, that's more from kind of a monitoring, debugging point of view, and not such that, that we would kind of push specific changes that way. Uh, when it comes to changes that we make in our algorithms, uh, there is the, the How Search Works page, or website, rather, that I'd really recommend there, which kind of goes through the steps that we take before an algorithm is actually pushed live. So it's definitely not the case 
that uh, any engineer can just say, oh, I have this fantastic idea. Uh, let me just code it up on the weekend and push uh, submit, and it'll be live in the search results on Monday. Uh, that's, that's not the case. We have a lot of reviews. We have a lot of tests in between, a lot of analysis that needs to be done. So that's all on this How Search Works uh, website, including a video from one of the launch reviews where uh, a whole group of people from search quality team at Google sit together and discuss the different algorithmic changes that are happening. So they discuss the pros and cons, they look at the analysis, they look at sample queries, at uh, sample results where specific changes are showing up. So that's something where there's this really long process involved in actually making something uh, change in the search results. Uh, my client's previous SEO company accidentally blocked a number of parameters using the URL parameters tool. Uh, this caused Google to stop crawling those pages. What do I do now? Uh, in a case like this, you can just remove those parameters from the URL parameter tool and uh, save it like that, and we'll take that into account in the next round. So you don't need to kind of revert anything. You can just delete those settings, and then you're fine again. Uh, notice Duke titles in subpages in Search Console, um, but all these pages have a canonical set to the main domain. Am I going to get any kind of demotion because of this? Um, so I think there are two aspects here. On the one hand, if you have a lot of pages that have the canonical set to the home page, then our algorithms might see that as you having set the rel canonical incorrectly, in that we see a lot of rel canonicals, but uh, they all point at the home page, and that's a pattern that we often see with websites that implement rel canonical wrong. So what might happen in a case like this is that we just ignore the rel canonical because we think, oh, the webmaster is trying to shoot themselves in the foot, and we can help them by just ignoring uh, this hint that they're providing with the rel canonical. So we'll try to do that in, in some of those cases. On the other hand, when it comes to the duplicate titles, specifically in Search Console, they're primarily based on what we've crawled. So just because a page has a rel canonical or maybe a no index on it doesn't mean that it won't be shown there in uh, the duplicate uh, what is it, duplicate titles, duplicate meta tag section in Search Console. So I kind of take that report, look at those URLs specifically, and just kind of double check that these are really URLs that are problematic. And I'd recommend maybe cleaning that up if uh, they are just duplicate URLs. And this isn't something that would penalize your website, so it's not that your website would be demoted because of any duplicate pages or duplicate titles that you have there. It's really just a matter of us giving you a little bit more information so that you can make an even better website and essentially rank a little bit better because you have more unique content, you have clearer titles that describe what these pages are about. Um, I'm trying to figure out uh, best practices for sitemaps. I have an eu.web.com site that serves all Europe regions differently. Do I claim the subdomain once, not geotarget, and use hreflang, or claim different variations and geotarget? Um, I'd primarily think about whether or not you actually have content for individual countries. And if you do have content that targets individual countries and that is really useful for these individual countries, these users, then maybe it makes sense to set up separate URLs, which could be uh, separate folders, separate subdomains for specific countries, which you can then geotarget, for example. And you can geotarget and use hreflang. You can just use hreflang if you want. I think geotargeting is a bit of a stronger signal for us because it really tells us this content is specific for users in this country. And we can use that to rank that content a little bit better, whereas the hreflang is more that you're telling us there's equivalent content for depending on the location or language settings. And we use that to swap out the content that we show in search. So the geotargeting helps with ranking in those individual countries for specific queries. And the hreflang helps to kind of make sure that the right version is shown when we do show it in search results. So it doesn't affect ranking. 
Um, if you have a .com site like that, then you can use subdomains or subdirectories for geotargeting. Um, you can also use a .eu site, which we also treat as a generic top-level domain. But if you, for example, you had a .de site or uh, some other country-specific top-level domain, then that would be tied to that country from the start. So that wouldn't be possible to set geotargeting for subdomains or subdirectories. John, yes. Can I just clarify that? Sure. So, if um, within Webmaster you have a country-based subdomain, so you have fr for France or whatever, uh, and the .com domain, if if you use if you do use a subfolder instead of a, can you not just set the sub subfolder up as a separate property within Webmaster Tools and geo-target that way, or can you not? You can only do that if it's on a generic top-level domain. So if you have .fr, you can't set up a subfolder for dot, uh, slash .us and say that's for the US, because we... No, but if you have a .com... Sure, yeah, then you can do that. If you have a .com and then .com slash .fr, you can set up a total different property under dot slash .fr, and you can geo-target that. Sure. The same as you can a subdomain. So it doesn't, yeah. doesn't matter. OK. From our point of view, subdomain and subdirectory works equally well there. Sometimes there are technical aspects on your side that make you like pick subdomain or subdirectory. But uh, both of those options would work. Uh, knowledge graph results contain a watch trailer button for movies, um, but sometimes they're wrong. Uh, the trailer is for the wrong movie. Do you know the contact that uh, can get that resolved? Um, I don't know offhand of any public location you can report that to, but you can definitely send that my way through maybe Google Plus or post in the help forum as well. That can sometimes give you help there too, but uh, you can definitely send that my way and I can pass that on to the team. Uh, if a link shows up only after an event on a page, like a click or a pull down or hover, can Googlebot use that link for page discovery? Um, sometimes, sometimes. So what sometimes happens is the link will be visible within the HTML or within the JavaScript file, and we can see, oh, there's a URL here. We'll try to double check what's, on, what's found on this URL. So if we can see the URL and the source code and the HTML somewhere, then sometimes we can pick that up for discovery. But on the other hand, if the JavaScript file is only loaded when some action happens on a page, or if it uh, requests a file from the server that's only visible when some action is done on the page, then we won't be able to see that. Uh, if we use third-party merchant reviews, and these are implemented on our site with schema.org slash reviews, should we also be posting these to Twitter or Facebook for social signals? Uh, does having reviews directly impact rankings, or is it uh, the improved click-through rate, which does? Um, I don't know about uh, posting them to Twitter and Facebook. That seems maybe a little bit tricky with regards to how you engage with this user-generated content. I don't know if that would always make sense to take user-generated content and publish it on other social networks uh, kind of as an advertising uh, for your website. So like I said before, we don't take social signals into account for crawling, indexing, and ranking. So it's not that you're missing anything specific by not having that content there. But uh, at the same time, I would probably shy away from just taking existing user-generated content and publishing that in your name on other locations. So maybe it makes sense to encourage your users to post directly on these uh, social networks if you think that they're relevant for your audience. If uh, there are people there that are interested in your content, then maybe it makes sense to encourage that. Uh, but uh, it's not something that I would say is a direct ranking factor or something that you need to do there. John? Again, more follow-up on that. If you're using, for example, um, we don't, but if you're using, say, TripAdvisor to pull through their reviews onto your site, which a lot of people do, do you generally ignore that content because it already appeared somewhere else first, so you're just doing it for the users, not not for Google? Or do you see it as, as long as it's in it, as additional content as well? 
so it can help or not. Um, when it comes to normal crawling and indexing, we probably see that as a part of a page and uh, use that for, for ranking as well. If someone's searching for something that's specific in maybe one of these reviews, then we'll recognize that it's also on this page, also on maybe the TripAdvisor page, and then we'll try to work out which of these pages we should be showing in search. And that could be the hotel, that could be the TripAdvisor page, depending maybe on the context of, of the person searching, of what they're specifically searching for. So from that point of view, that's something we would kind of treat as, as text on the page, even if it's the same as something somewhere else. Uh, when it comes to reviews, especially the, the structured data markup, the rich snippets, that's always a bit of a tricky topic because on the one hand, we'd like to have one canonical source for these reviews and have that source marked up. On the other hand, sometimes it makes sense to have like one page with aggregated reviews. So if you're a hotel, maybe you have reviews on TripAdvisor, maybe on some other uh, sites, and maybe you'd like to like combine these reviews on your hotel page. So. That's something which I think is still a bit of a tricky topic with regards to the structured data. Uh, with regards to just text on a page, that's something you can definitely do if, you, if that makes sense for you. It's not that we would treat that as spam or that we would demote a website because it has like a snippet of text that's also found on the TripAdvisor site. So uh, John, regarding the tricky part, so would you recommend websites not to do that if they pull up uh, multiple uh, reviews from multiple websites and mark them up with the uh, structured data should they not do that is there a problem they might get ignored or something like that I think our guidelines specifically mentioned that uh, the structured data markup should really be for content that's unique to your website that was kind of originated from your website but I don't know offhand if that has changed recently. I know they were considering some changes there because it, it is a kind of a borderline situation. Sometimes it makes sense. Sometimes it's just the collection of spam. So someone scraping a bunch of review sites and marking that up, that's not really going to be that useful for us. So um, I don't know what, what the current status is there. I, I'd recommend kind of double checking the guidelines that we have in the Help Center. OK, if you have any new updates, maybe you can just post them on the event page or something. Sure. Hey, John, uh, related to that, for e-commerce websites, like say we have the same product available in different variants, like color or memory, uh, do you think it's a good idea if we can uh, copy the same reviews across these 10 variants, uh, break up by color or the GB, for example? How do um, we that can make sense. Um, I think. In a situation like that, you always have to consider maybe it makes sense just having one product page for all of these variants on one URL rather than splitting it up across multiple URLs. Because by splitting it up, you're kind of diluting the value of, the, of that product. On the other hand, maybe the specific variants are so unique that you need to have separate pages. So that's something that kind of taking a step back, I'd look at first. Does it really make sense to split up this product into separate pages? Um, if, if it is exactly the same product and you just have reviews and different variants, then I think that's totally up to you whether or not you want to reuse those reviews and show those as well. So, um, for example, I sometimes see that on, uh, what is it, book review websites or book websites where you'll have like an English site and a German site, but the German site also sells the English book, then maybe the review that was posted on the English site for the English version of the book also is useful for users going to the German site looking at the English book. So that's kind of, sometimes it makes sense to reuse some of those reviews. Sometimes they're just unique or specific that you can't really reuse them. OK. Well, and since you mentioned books, right, so most of the time the book description pretty much same across the web. So uh, even we copy like the same thing what is there in different websites. So how Google treats that? Like I mean, we, though we can build a lot of UGC content, still you consider that as a duplicate content? Yeah. So what what will happen there is we'll um, recognize that this block of text is duplicated, and we'll index those pages separately because they are unique pages on unique sites maybe even, and uh, we'll know that okay this page is about this book, and there's lots of content on here that's unique. There's also this 
block of text here that's the same across multiple sites. So what will happen is if someone is searching specifically for something that's just in that block of text there, we'll recognize, oh, this block of text is the same across multiple sites. So it doesn't make sense to show all of these sites in the same search result. So we'll try to pick one of these sites to show which is most relevant for the user and filter the other ones out. So it's not that they're penalized in any way, but rather we'll try to pick the most relevant version of that and show that in search. So for example, if uh, you have a book site for the US and one for the UK and one for India, and they all have the same description, if a user in India is searching, then maybe we'll show the Indian version of that site. If the user in the US is searching, we'll show the US version of that site. So it's not that we remove those pages from search, but we understand that this block of text is the same, so we'll try to match whichever one fits in there best. Okay, cool. So I have two more questions. Um, lately, what we have observed is uh, we have two, for the same product, we have two different URLs. One is with uppercase and one is lowercase. And we try to block the lowercase and keep the uppercase as a primary URL. So, but what we observed is like Google started crawling both and when I go to the cached version of the lowercase, it still shows me the uppercase version all the time. Right, though it has a self connect of the lowercase URL. So, do Google understand like all these case sensitive and we don't have to worry about it? Um, what, what generally happens there is we see that the pages are exact duplicates and we'll just keep one of these pages indexed, but we'll know about the other URL. So that's something where Canonical helps us is one tip, but also links within the website helps us, maybe redirects within the website helps us. All of these things give us tips about which version we should be indexing. Um, from my point of view, it's not a critical problem, but we are crawling twice as many URLs from your website as we actually need to be. So if your server is kind of limited, then that might mean we can't pick up all of the new content. So I try to fix that by being really consistent within the website, right? but I wouldn't see it as a critical problem. Okay. Because the day we decided to fix it, we saw the lowercase replaced with the uppercase URL. We were like really surprised that Google now understanding the difference between these two. OK, yeah. the last question is, like, uh, is Google started reading the content, indexing the content in Ajax? Because uh, all my user-generated reviews are in Ajax mode. When I search the review in Google search box, I can see that in the snippet of my website but not available in the cache text version. Yeah. Um, that usually happens like that. So uh, we try to process JavaScript, pull out the content that's pulled in with Ajax or other technologies if they're not blocked, and we'll use that for indexing the page. But the cache version is still the pure HTML version. So you'll see it in a snippet. You'll see it ranking. But the cache page is the pure HTML page that might not show that directly. So does that mean Google considers that content inside that, right? Sure. I don't have anything in specific for that particular block of content to crawl. Yeah. OK, cool. All right, let me run through a bunch of the questions that were submitted, and then we'll open it up for quest uh, normal questions here live again. Um, our website has local and English language versions of our pages. We added hreflang, uh, local English x default attributes on both versions. Somehow, Google is still ranking the English version first, but at a much lower rank. What's going on? So hreflang essentially just tells us to swap out the URLs when they are ranking. It doesn't affect ranking directly. So any changes you're seeing in ranking would be from something else. Uh, you also wouldn't be seeing any kind of promotion in ranking uh, with regards to, to the search results there. So we're really just looking at the search results that we see there, double check that the hreflang matches where the user is, and then swapping out the URLs against the version that might fit the user better. Uh, how's our mobile-only index project going? So I assume this applies to app indexing of app-only content. And as far as I know, the team is working on that. I don't have any updates to share at the moment. Uh, there are pages on our site that never show in search results. I've searched for a specific string, but I uh, always get zero results. There are no errors in Search Console. Uh, these pages are in the sitemap. I've explicitly fetched a few pages, but it hasn't helped. It's really hard to say what that might be without looking at the actual URLs. So I'd recommend maybe starting a thread and help forum and getting some other people to look at that and maybe escalating that to us from the web from the help forums afterwards. But uh, it's really hard to say what might be happening there, short of maybe a no index being on these pages accidentally. 
Uh, as a Google worker, do you have direct access to check if a site is penalized with any algorithm? Uh, is there some kind of al operating system that you use to access a complete site profile? Um, so I kind of touched upon this earlier. We do have various tools to diagnose the search results to see what's happening there, to diagnose how sites are standing in search, to double check that things are working as they're supposed to be working. So this is something where we, we do need to have these kind of tools. Otherwise, we would just have a black box on our side and not really know what's happening either. Uh, is the link rel canonical a suggestion or a directive to Google? It's a suggestion on our side. And we do try to take it into account whenever possible. But when we recognize that it's wrong, we'll try to ignore it. Or when we get very conflicting signals, then we'll use it as kind of an input in our canonical algorithm. But it's not the, the de definitive answer. So if, for example, your whole site links to one version, but it has a rel canonical to the other version, then that's very conflicting for us, because we don't really know which version you really want to have indexed. On the one hand, the site says this. On the other hand, the canonical says something different. So as much as possible, be consistent within your website. I think that's always great advice for SEO. Uh, I use Chrome, the search result, uh, sometimes from Google.com, sometimes from uh, my local. Google, uh, please advise. So to some extent, I believe uh, Google.com redirects to the local version whenever possible. But there's a way to kind of block that from happening by setting a no country redirect. You can visit, I think, Google.com slash NCR that uh, removes that country redirect for, for a period of time, which can be useful for testing, for example. But uh, in general, that's something that I would expect to, to have happen, that you get redirected to a local version. Uh, if a website generates tens of thousands of new content and new pages, then how can we speed up crawling and indexing by Google Search? Um, I'd recommend using a sitemap whenever possible to let us know about all of these new pages. I'd also make sure that your server is really top speed that we can actually crawl all of this content as quickly as possible. And of course, I'd make sure that the content that you're providing like this is really high quality and interesting enough that when Googlebot goes through a portion of that, it doesn't uh, get bored and think, oh, this is content I've already seen before. This is low quality content. That we really see that this is content that's missing that we want to index as well. Uh, can you delve a little into the Search Console, into how Search Console directly correlates with Google Plus and Wikipedia articles to produce a better aesthetic in search results? Ooh, this sounds like a complicated question. Um, I probably need some more context about what, what specifically you're asking there. So if maybe you can uh, start a Google Plus post with a little bit more information that might be useful and might be able to find someone to help you get some information there. Um, I'm aware of personally identifying information added uh, to Google Analytics and custom dimensions is against terms of services. But is it possible to encrypt personal data before push to Google Analytics? I can't speak for Google Analytics, so I don't really know what what's in the terms of service there or what you can do there. So I recommend going to maybe an analytics forum for more information about that. Uh, what's a good URL parameter handling setting? Uh, should I always default to let Googlebot decide? Um, so let Googlebot decide is the default setting that we show for parameters that we found by crawling. If you're happy with the way things are being indexed, just leave it at that. If there's something very special that you want to kind of control or guide, then you can give us more information there. But uh, if things are working out with the URL parameters for you, I just leave it at that and uh, kind of let Googlebot do its thing. OK, 
four more questions. Let me run through these quick, and we'll still have time for a bit of discussion. Uh, are there currently variations of search results which rotate day by day? Not specifically, but we do a lot of experiments. So chances are, anytime you're doing a search on Google, you're probably within 20, 30, 40, 50 different experiments at the same time. And these are running globally across uh, all of the search results. And because of that, you might see changes from day to day. Or you might see changes depending on the browser or location you're searching from. Um, how should list results be canonicalized if they have pagination and ordering parameters to the top, to page equals number, or to both? Uh, what's a good parameter handling setting for the ordering parameter? Uh, we did a blog post about pagination maybe last year or the year before that. I'm not sure. I double check that blog post and kind of uh, check the advice that's given there because some of this uh, is probably useful to have a bit more context about. Uh, if a list of domains is submitted to the disavow tools and includes domains that should not have been disavowed, is it enough to submit a new file with those domains removed? Yes, that's enough. Just submit a new file with uh, only the URLs that you do want to have disavowed, and the old file will be ignored. Uh, if a link shows up only after an event, we check this. And this is, I think, not a question. Wow, we made it through. OK. More questions from, from you guys. We still have a couple minutes left. Wow. Hey, John. Uh, lately, what we have seen is uh, since Google started indexing all the JavaScript, the main menu has become like 3 fourth of the page, and the actual content become 1 fourth of the page in Google cache text. Uh, do you recommend if you for bot specifically to keep the menu uh, not to crawl at the beginning, but push all the content to the top? and index the menu maybe later on the page? I wouldn't worry about that. So uh, we, we try to recognize things. We call them boilerplate when the same content is included over and over across the website, which is often like a menu or a sidebar or a footer. And we try to treat that appropriately. So it's not something that you need to artificially move around in your HTML code. OK. Because when we look at the page, it's only like half of the page, not more than that. So I shouldn't worry about it. Where where would you look at the page? When you look at the cache text, uh, I okay. can see like, the uh, first fold of the page, not the bottom of the page. Um, I can ping. Yeah, I probably have to take a look at the URL, but usually that's that's no problem. Like if the main content is being pulled in with JavaScript, then you wouldn't see that in the cache page anyway. Okay, I just ping you the link. So it can okay. Uh, John, if I can, uh, this is a question regarding uh, uh, an online bookstore I've started working with. Uh, they have a few issues with their CMS platform. It's a custom CMS. So uh, issues like uh, certain pages have page speed of single digits, like 2 out of 100. Uh, there are certain nofollow in, uh, no internal links. Uh, some pages, uh, new pages, for example, and this is my issue because they l recently launched a new book, and uh, the URL doesn't seem to be crawled properly. The cache version shows the text without the CSS, uh, although uh, today I checked it and it seems to appear normal. So uh, I just wanted to ask if you can take a look and tell me if you've seen any um, issues regarding crawling or accessibility or something like that. They have a lot of issues. And so they also have two canonicals on the product pages. I don't know uh, how Google handles that. OK. Um, if there's any issues. That sounds, sounds like something complicated. I mean, it sounds like you've already found a lot of issues, which, which is a good start. But uh, I don't think I can just, like, take a quick glance and tell you this is broken, too. Uh, but I I'd kind of go through those things that you mentioned. You probably found some other things, too, um, to, to kind of well, take a well, look at. Certain things, like two canonicals on the same page, I know you kind of ignore that, for example. Or if they're the same, they point to the same uh, if URL. If they point to the same URL, then yeah, I don't know. It's not, not really critical. But it's probably something. I mean, these are all like small things that, that are worth kind of taking care of. 
Um, but it's, it's really hard to just take a look at a website and say, oh, this particular part of crawling or indexing is broken. So I almost need a bit more time, or maybe it's even worth checking in with the help forum on, on something like that. Um, oh, yeah. Just we just want to know that maybe uh, if Google kind of was blocked at some point and stopped crawling or something like that. Uh, since they launched this this new page with the new book, uh, it seems to have been indexed. It appears in the index, but whenever I search for the exact title, I get some other page that has like the previous volume of the book or something like that. Uh, so I I just wanted to be sure that whether yeah. They, I don't see it directly. I, I don't see anything offhand there. Uh, Rudra, I, okay. I checked the, the cache page that you linked to there, and that looks fine from my point of view. Uh, if you click on the, the text-only version for that page, it mm -hmm. also kind of shows the content if you scroll down. So um, from my point of view, that, that seems That's fine. actually the uh, domain. This is actually the, the page that we had issues the new uh, product page that we had issues with. And until yesterday, it was only showing the text-only version, no CSS or anything. I did a fetch and submit to index again, and today seems to be fine, although fetches Google always showed the correct page, so I don't know why uh, the cache page wouldn't show the CSS part. So yeah, there's just so many issues with the, the site that I'm not sure which one should be like kind of prioritized yeah. to make sure that things are getting indexed and crawled. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I, I seems like something a bit more complicated than just no index or not no index. So uh, oh, just see anything that pops up to you, so that's that's okay. Yeah. I just want to make sure. That. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Hey John, uh, I think if you look at the actual page, it has so much content at the bottom of the page that is not part of the cache text. Do you say it's not a problem? Just want to double confirm that. Um, so the cache page that that you link to below the the first time, I thought that was fine. So that's not something that I worry about. And looking at this page, if you look at the HTML source, it has all of the content in links as well. So from my point of view, that should be fine. Yeah. Cool. I mean, what what I would do in a case like this is uh, use fetches Google with the rendering option to kind of double check that the page that uh, is shown kind of matches what you would see in a browser, what you would expect to see. And if that's the case, then you pretty much have it covered. OK, good. Uh, John, regarding hreflang, uh, this is a more of a generic question. Uh, let's say you have a German uh, website and a French website that are equivalent, equivalent and you have hreflang between them, everything is set up properly. And you're in Germany, and you search for a specific French keyword. Uh, Google is going to show you the French version of the page regardless of hreflang, right? Because that's where the, I don't know, if the keyword is French, so it's the French version of the German one. That's always a kind of a, a borderline case, and uh, what happens there is the hreflang doesn't blindly affect all search results, but rather it's kind of a factor in there. And if we see that uh, someone is specifically looking for one version of the page, we'll try to show that to them. So you're basically looking at the intent. So you're trying to figure out what the user really wants to see. Well, I mean, what, what we can look at is like the language of the query, the, the settings in the browser, the settings in Google, and see, is this user searching in German or searching in French? Um, for example, I, I sometimes have that in that I'm in Switzerland, and I'll be searching for something in English. And it, it wouldn't make sense for hreflang to kind of swap out the German version in the search results just because I happen to be in, in German-speaking country. Right, so it's like the canonical tag. It's more of a suggestion. Yes, it, it definitely. makes sense. You're going to take it into account. Definitely, yeah. Mm -hmm. John, can I ask a question about uh, Search Console? Sure. Um, I'm just wondering. Um, it, first of all, is there uh, JavaScript access to Search Console? And secondly, if providing there is. 
Um, is it possible to pull data on more than one dimension, specifically uh, keyword and the landing pages that um, uh, has been rendered in search? Yes, you can do that with the Search Analytics API. I think we launched that maybe last week. Um, I don't know specifically about like a JavaScript API to access that. I think that should be possible with the normal Google JavaScript API framework uh, that you can access that. But with the Search Analytics data, you can definitely request two dimensions. You can say from this time frame, maybe filter it by country, maybe by device type, and then you'll get all of that information through the API. It takes, I guess, a little bit of work to figure out exactly what you're looking for. Um, maybe that makes sense to try that in JavaScript or a simple Python script or some examples on on the documentation there. So I, I play around with that. I, I see that uh, some tools are already out there that are using this data. I suspect it'll be visible in more tools over time. Great, thanks. And um, yeah, given that it's relatively new, is it also pull, uh, possible to pull more than 1,000 values? Um, it has a limit of, what is it, 5,000 rows at the moment. Uh, but there are things that you can do to kind of get more information there. So you could, for example, instead of looking at a month of data, split it up by week or split it up by day even and do these requests separately so that you can get 5,000 rows for each day and you can combine that together and kind of get an aggregated view that has more than 1,000 rows. So there, there are lots of neat possibilities there. Fantastic. Thank you. Is there any pagination uh, of Parameter that you can set to get my like yet? I mean, I, I don't know if, the, if that's uh, planned or if that's actually coming. It probably depends on the feedback that we get, but uh, at least not at the moment. All right. Uh, with that, let's take a break here. Uh, thank you all for joining. Thanks for all of the questions, um, discussions here in the Hangout as well. And maybe I'll see you again in one of the future ones. Until then, I wish you guys a great weekend. Bye, everyone. Bye, Bye everyone. Sean. <laughs> no, no, no.